Good evening and welcome to our study. I know that you are not expecting to see my face at this hour. Uh, we are praying for our assistant pastor. She's recovering from a procedure. And so we're going to pick up in the Genesis study. And I'm aware that everybody who's watching or may be in the sanctuary is not familiar with our study. But we are in Genesis chapters 36 and 37 today. Genesis 36 and 37. So I'm going to give you a brief recap of what's going on. So br just briefly, last, last time we were together, we talked about how Jacob and Esau had finally made up, if you want to call it that. They made up. They had come back as a family. They buried their, fa their father. The text begins to call, bring th that story to an end. And so for a little brief period, the text kind of gives us some insinuations that they're living in the same region. Now, a couple of chapters prior, you remember they reunited, and when they reunited, Jacob says, we're going to come join you in Seir, but never comes. And all this chaos breaks out. His daughter gets raped. The boys go and burn up the city, and they go kill all the men, and all this chaos goes on. We talk about the dysfunction of the family. So they come back. They bury their father. They kind of make up, and, and, and it kind of ties a knot on Isaac. Now today, we're going to pick up in what we would call Genesis 36, but Genesis 36, I want us to be aware, is one of those chapters that if you were reading it in your private time, you would probably skip it. It's one of those where you're like, this is irrelevant, this is not encouraging me, this is not teaching me about faith, but there's a couple of things I want us to see, and once we get out of it, we're going to go into 37, and you can be excited about Joseph and all of his dreams and all of that. But let's hop in 36. It reads this way. I've got the King James and the NIV open. I'm going to start in King James, and we'll see how we end up. Genesis 36 reads this way. It says, now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Ohilamabah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Basemith, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nehaboth, and Adah bare to Esau, Eliphaz, and Basemith bare rule. And, and it continues on, and it gives us this genealogy. I want us to start here, because we're talking about these genealogies of, we've been talking about the genealogies of Abraham, and how all this faith comes from Abraham. We talk about all these genealogies about Isaac, and we all of this good faith and all these things. We don't hear much about Esau, but you've heard of the Edomites, haven't you? You've heard of the Edomites. So Esau is the ancestor of the Edomites, and because Esau is the ancestor of the Edomites, we find this interesting relationship with Isaac, I mean with, with the Israelites and, and the Edomites. Why is that? Do you remember when Isaac, I mean when um, Jacob and Esau were born, Esau says, God says to him, I've hated Esau, but I've loved Jacob. And a lot of times we read that text and we're like, that's kind of harsh. God said he hated this baby that was born. But God says, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau. And this chapter, I want us to spend some time because we're going to explore what it means for God to hate. Because I guarantee you what you would consider God, your, what you hate and what God hates doesn't look the same. Because Esau, on, on the, on the, from, from what we see, looks like he's loved by God. Esau has money. Esau has a big family. If you recall, um, not only does he have money and a big family, it seems like he's got everything that people desire. People go to school to get degrees so they can have money. People go and they, they try to do everything to make a dollar shake. You got everybody hope, trying to rip this person off. Y'all, I just got back from Belize. And I got off of this, we went snorkeling. We get off this boat, it's this guy selling brownies. And he looks me in the eye and he says, I have special brownies. <laughs> yeah, he, I got special brownies. Now you may not enjoy the brownie, but we will enjoy you. And he was saying, but if you buy it, it will help feed my family. And, and, and people will do anything to gain wealth, okay? And that's, that's the point I want you to do. People will do anything to gain wealth. So Esau, according to what we would see in, in, in our earthly eyes, is a successful man. But the Bible still says that God hated Esau. 
And that's a rough one for me, especially, you know, a lot of you got a lot of preachers preaching prosperity. And I believe God wants you to prosper. That's biblical. But if your heart is not in the right place, is that God honoring prosperity? So here we go. We've, 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 got, we've got the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And I want us to see this. Esau is the, son, the father of the Edomites, right? Um, and and we, we, the Edomites are mentioned 130 times in the scripture. So they're just kind of important. They're mentioned 130 times in the scripture. Not only are they mentioned 130 times in the scripture, we see, we see that when the uh, uh, children of Israel come out of Egypt and they're trying to get to the promised land, they, they try to go through Edom and the Edomites won't let them. But then later down the road, when, when Saul is reigning in Israel, Saul says, um, Saul, Saul makes them subject to them. So I want you to see what happens. So in the history, Esau is born first, okay? Esau is born first. Jacob is holding on to his heel. Seems like Esau's on top. Jacob gets the blessing. Seems like Jacob is on top. Esau's on bottom, okay? Israel comes out of Egypt. Are you following me? Israel comes out of Egypt. When they come out of Egypt, they, are, they have to pass through Edom to get to where they're going, and they won't let them go. Looks like who's on top? Israel's on top, um, Edom, Edom is on top again. Then Saul is reigning. Saul is reigning, and now they're subject to the Edom. They're subject to Israel again. So this whole time through history, they're wrestling, going back and forth. This one's on top. That one's on top. This one's on top. And I want you to remember that the Bible said something when Esau and Jacob were born. It said there's two nations in your, in your belly, and they're at war with each other. And so we see this play out throughout not just the biblical record, but through history. And so as we continue to read, and we, we read the, the genealogies, I want us to skip it. I want us to skip down. And I want us to skip. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of genealogies. Uh, <laughs> but, what, but what I do want us to, to jump down to is I want to see, see this. It says, these were the chiefs of the, of the sons of of Esau. And I want us to see this because it says when we see these kings and chiefs among the descendants of Esau, I want us to understand what God meant when he said that he hated Esau. God didn't want Esau dead. God didn't want to see Esau embarrassed. He, he wasn't like us. He wasn't thinking like us. When the Bible says that he hated Esau, he says, I, I'm not going to be lukewarm about who represents me. I'm, I'm not going to allow someone who, who wants my hand but not my face. And I want us to think about that because a lot of times it's so easy in our, in our American culture to get in a place where we love the hand of God. Lord, bless me indeed. God, if you'll just heal my body. God, if you'll just do. God, if you'll just allow me to get through this. Lord, if you'll get me out of this, I'll serve you all the days of my life. But how many of us can truly say that we desire his face and his presence? And so when we see this, this the scripture say, reads it this way. It says, when we, uh, it says, these are the chiefs and the sons of Esau. It lists for verse after verse after verse all this power. But not one time does it list the faith. Not one time does it go down his lineage and talk about this one. Bless the name of God. Not one time among the Edomites, with the exception of people who think that Jobab was Job, but that's not founded in scripture. We don't see one time where an Edomite says, I'm going to bless his name. Not one time. The Edomites are mentioned 130 times. They're the descendants of Abraham. They had a picture of faith in front of them, but nobody in the whole family. Say, God, tell me about yourself. And so God says, I hate that because you coveted the blessing only in fleshly desires. You wanted the house, you wanted the cars, but never did you say, God, I want you. And although Jacob struggled between being Jacob and Israel and he struggled and he wrestled, he came back 
every now and then he would come back. He'd be like, okay, God, I'm going to talk to you. We're going to try this thing again. I know I've been trying to figure it out on my, my own, but something is not working, so I'm going to try you. And although Jacob was flawed, severely so, his desire above all else at the end of his life was that God be pleased. And so I want you to think about it because I think in church a lot of times we think that people got to be perfect. We think that the ones that God loves are perfect and they never sin and they are all great and, and, and all these things. And, and that is far from the truth. We, we think that people have to be, behave a certain way all the time and they are never, they, if, if they don't look like Jesus Jr., that they are not God's favorite. But the truth of the matter is the ones that God loves circle back to him every time. Okay? So that's the crux. That's the essence of what I want you to see in chapter 36. Now, we're going to go to 37 and we're going to spend the rest of our study this evening in chapter 37. Because chapter 37 is kind of where it gets exciting. Um, and I'm going to say this. Y'all do me a favor. I know you've read about Joseph in your Bible studies and your Sunday school lessons. I know you know all about the multi-toilet coat. Put it down for a second. Okay? Put it down for a second. Let's hang out in 37 with fresh eyes. Okay? Because I guarantee that if you go, go to it with fresh eyes, you'll see something you've never seen before. But if y'all go to it with the history and all that you know, because, you know, I, I remember drawing the color in the pictures in this very Sunday school class, talking about the multicolored coat. But I guarantee that after I've studied it for 20-something years, I saw so much newness this evening, okay? All right, chapter 37 reads this way. Actually, let's... Let's get there first. Seven. Okay. Chapter 37. And, they, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock of his brethren. The lad was with the sons of Bilhah, was the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph being 17 years old. Now, I want to start here because I want us to remember what's going on in Genesis up until this point. Because we got Joseph, but how did we get to Joseph? We started with Enoch. Y'all remember Enoch? And Enoch, you remember, he walked by faith. You know, he walked, he walked with God so much that God said, you ain't got to die. I'm going to just take you with me. You're not going to feel the sting of death. You're going to come with me. Enoch walks with faith. Then his grandson comes about, Noah. Y'all remember Noah? Noah perseveres by faith. Remember, Noah was living in an age where there had not been rain, and they definitely were not studying God. And, and, and although there had not been rain and they were not studying God, he said, well, God said it's going to rain, so I'm going to be obedient. So he perseveres in a time where nobody believes him. So you have Enoch who walks by faith. You have Noah who perseveres by faith. You have Abraham who walks in the obedience of faith. Y'all remember he's prayed and he's desired this child for all these years, finally gets it. God says, kill him. You love me so much, kill him. We're going to see, do you serve Isaac or do you serve me? Who do you worship? And I really want you to think, I know you've heard this, people have probably asked you, to, to ask you this question before, but if you prayed for something for 50 years, would you kill it? If God said it, if you worked all your life to build that business, it finally made it to a million dollars a year, and God said, close it. Don't sell it, close it. If, 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 if you prayed for that child and you had miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage, the child is finally here healthy and you love that child, you built a relationship with it, and God said, walk away. Would you do it? So Abraham walks in obedience, but then Isaac proves the power of faith. See, Abraham's obedience means nothing unless Isaac stays there and believes that his father has heard from God. 
Because we, 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 we might have been taught in Sunday school or in, got the insinuation that he was a child, but he was old enough to defy his father. And so the obedience that he had for his father and the obedience that his father had to God shows the power of faith. That if I'll go to the top of the mountain and I'll, I'll show that faith to my children, that power goes down multiple generations the same way that the power went down the multiple generations to the cross. And so we see Enoch who walks through faith. We see Noah who perseveres through faith. We see uh, Abraham who has the obedience of faith. We see Isaac who has the power of faith. And today we see Jacob who has the discipline of faith. Today we're introduced to Jacob who has the discipline of faith. Now, I remember sitting in Reverend Nolan's Bible study class probably 15, 20 years ago. And I was no more than maybe seven or eight. And he asked the class the question. He says, y'all, what does discipline mean? And I raised my hand. I said, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me. And, 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 he, and he said, okay, what, what do you think the answer is? I said, it's when your parents beat your behind. That's what discipline is. And, 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 and I really, it, from in my house, when my parents said, you're about to be disciplined, that's what I thought it meant. Go get the belt. Go get the switch. But what I learned, and the Holy Spirit helped me this morning, is that discipline in the beginning feels like the belt. In the beginning, when you, when you start working out, it hurts like nobody's business. But that discipline turns into something that, that is controlled, okay? A better example is as a child, it was hard to sit still. Have y'all ever seen a child try to sit still? It's like, it's like trying to hurt cows. It's hard for them to sit still, but when they're 20 and 30 and they can sit through a lecture and they can focus, that discipline has now turned into something positive. But it took the pain of the beginning that would turn it into something better, okay? Are y'all following where I'm going? So this, this evening, we've got Joseph in our text, okay, who, who shows us the discipline of faith. Faith is a discipline. Faith is a discipline. I know we tell everybody, you got to have faith, you got to believe, but faith is hard. Faith is not simple. If faith was easy, everybody in the church would be millionaires. Nobody would be fat. Everybody would have six-pack abs. We'd all be, if, if faith was easy, okay, if discipline was easy, we'd all, it would, it, we wouldn't struggle. Nobody would be depressed. When our loved ones died, all of us would have a smile. If faith was easy, but faith is a discipline. And so we see that through the life of Joseph. And so Joseph is 17 years old. And he was feeding the flock with his brothers. So he's out there with his 11 other brothers. He's feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah. I'm in verse 2. And his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. All right, let me help you. Joseph, our, our, our leading character here, sent, sitting there, out there working with his brothers, and he sees them doing something they should not be doing. His father has sent them out there to work. They're supposed to be responsible. The Bible doesn't quite tell us exactly what it is they're doing, but they're out there doing something they're not supposed to be doing. And so Joseph, being the goody two shoes that he is, goes back and he says, Daddy, everybody's down there doing wrong. What's wrong with them? Now, I don't know about you, but y'all ever got title told on? It's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling. I remember, and y'all don't tell my parents even though they're sitting in the back. I remember my, me and my little sister would, would fight. And as soon as Aaron would start crying, I would start apologizing. Please don't go tell mom and daddy. Please, please, because nobody wants to be told on. Okay, even when you're wrong. So he's gone back and he's told the evil report. Now Joseph hasn't done anything wrong. He's been upright. He's been honest. He doesn't have a lot of street sense. But he's been upright. He's been honest. So he goes back and he tells the evil report. Now verse 3, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. He made him a coat of many colors. Now, I remember seeing the little sheets that you colored where it looked like it was rainbow. 
But when we look back at what the Hebrew actually says and the, and the tunics of the age, if someone had a coat of many colors, it was really a long coat with long sleeves with all types of ornaments on it. And it was a sign of someone who had gotten a promotion. And so he goes from being asked to feed in the field with his brothers to now being the boss. Now you imagine this, Reuben is the oldest. Joseph is number 11. You done sent this little 17 year old to come be in charge of me out in the field and he, his fingernails aren't even dirty. And we're chasing cattle and planting stuff and, and Joseph is in charge. And so you, you, you've got the situation where he's got this promotion. You know, he's, he's been upgraded but everybody around him cannot see the benefit of him being upgraded. There's a whole bunch of envy in the room. Okay, and so he, he, he's, got, he's got this coat of many colors, and when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably unto him. I want you to see this. His, when his brothers realized it, He's my daddy, but he likes him more. Now, I want us to be real. You know, it reads like a really pretty, clean text. But truthfully, if you had a child that you favored over all the other children, that's going to breed some self-esteem issues in that house. That's going to breed some issues in that house. And, and, and I'm in no way is going to excuse what those boys did to Joseph. But because the favor was outward, it allowed some things to be rooted in them that they never got expressed. And, and so I, wa I want to pause, and, and, and all of you all have grown children, so I'm not going to talk to you right now. But I am going to talk to my young adults who watch sometimes. Whenever we, sh we show favoritism to children, we're, we're setting them up to have problems in the future. Because the child that's favored thinks that they're more greater than they ought to be. But the children who are not favored grow up to have issues within themselves that are not even theirs. And this happens when we don't deal with things within ourselves. And I'm going to leave that alone. Um, so his, his brothers see it. They, they hate him. And they can't even talk to him. They don't even want to look him in the eyes. They, don't, they can't speak peaceably to him. Every time they walk in the room, it's an argument, it's a fight. They can't, they, there is no peace in the house because daddy has favored this one. And then verse, four, five, verse 5 says it this way. He says, and Joseph dreamed a dream. He told his brother that he had hated him yet the more. And he told it to his brother and they hated him the more. And he said unto them, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, I was binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and, and, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my, seat, my, my sheaf. And his brother said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Shall you have dominion over us? They hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, I like Joseph. I do. But Joseph, he really wasn't that bright when it came to people skills. <laughs> I like him. I like him. You know, I like the way that, you know, he, he seems to be. He got all this faith. He got discipline. He, he's got it. But he didn't get how to deal with people. Because you, when you walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm going to get a promotion over you, and I'm going to take your job, and I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to be your boss. You wipe my diapers, but I, I'm going to own everything that you got. <laughs> he didn't have any people skills. <laughs> he didn't have any people skills. So Joseph <laughs> goes and he tells them this, and y'all know what happens, they hate him. That hate, that, in, that, that malice is growing on the inside of them. And so you, not only does daddy hate you, now you're having dreams that now we're gonna, you're gonna be over us. And then and they question him, they say, so you really think that? And he's like, yeah, yeah I had the dream, the dream that, that's what the dream said. And, and so he's getting excited about the blessings of God on his life. And everybody around him is hating him for the blessings of God in his life. And, and I, I want to pause there because sometimes you got to be careful not to cast your pearls before pigs. Sometimes you got to be careful to realize that everybody is not in your corner. Everybody is not happy for you. And you can love them from a distance, show the love of God, 
But if you can't, you, you, everybody is not the inner circle. Even Jesus, he had the 12, but there were three that he let go up to the mountain. There were some people he could not allow to see him in vulnerable moments. And sometimes we got to be more careful about who we share what with. Or because they will talk us out of what God, God, did you notice what they say to him? They said, do you really believe that you are going to be above us? Now, have you thinking that you're not called to be who you are? That have you thinking that you're not, you're not in? They will convince you otherwise. Okay? So, let's keep moving. Let's see. Um, verse 8. No, no. Verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream. And he told it to his brethren. And he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that you had dreamed? Shall I and thy mother, thy brethren indeed, come back to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brothers envied him. But his father observed the same. So he has another dream. Now, it wouldn't be a study that I'm teaching if I don't tell you to look somewhere else in the Bible. Revelation 12.1 makes reference again to Israel being uh, the 12 stars, the 12 stars, the sun and the moon. Okay? And so this is already beginning to shape. I want you to see how God is. This is already beginning to shape the story from the beginning to the end. And so this is, remember, this is the beginnings. We're talking about the original 12 brothers, the original 12 tribes of Israel. This is already beginning to shape the story on how God is going to end it, okay? Remember, and I've said it a thousand times in, in, in the study, that everything that is revealed in the New Testament is concealed in the Old. So often you can be reading your Bible and you'll see something, you're like, what? why are they talking about stars and moons? If you read your New Testament, you'll find it somewhere in there. Same way that if you're reading your New Testament and you see something, you're like, that don't make sense. You can read <laughs> your Old Testament and you'll see it. It ratifies it, okay? So he, he says, he says, I, uh, I, he has this dream and all of a sudden he's believing. He's, well, he says to them, he says, I, uh, Mama and Daddy going to bow down to me too. You know, God is going to really elevate me. Now I want you to see this. This envy is, 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 is getting deeper. It's getting deeper. We've gone from daddy loves me more. Daddy gave me a, gave me a coat. Not only did daddy give me a coat, now I'm having a dream that y'all are going to bow to me. Now mom and daddy are going to bow to me. And so every time it's going deeper and deeper and deeper. And I want to admonish you, guard your heart. Guard your heart. If you might, it might be somebody you think that, the, you know, it just made you a little mad. They, they, I hate the way they behave. They always keeping up drama. Guard your heart. Because it, what started out as they said something wrong to me will turn into you hating them and you don't know how you got there. Okay? And, 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 and I, can, I can speak from firsthand experience that it is Satan's desire to corrupt your heart. Because if he can corrupt your heart, he can keep you out of the best that God has for you. Your heart. Okay. He says, all right. Verse 11. And he says, and his brothers envied him, but his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed his father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, do not thy brothers feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you unto them. And he said to him, here I am. And he said to him, go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks and bring the word again. So he sent him out the vale of Hebron and he, he came to Shechem. And the third man found him and behold, he was wandering in the field. And a man asked him saying, Who, so what, what are you looking for? And that's me, it says, what seekest thou? But what are you looking for? And he said, I seek my brethren, tell me, I pray thee, where are they that they feed their flocks? And the man said, they departed hence. For I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. And jo Joseph went after his brothers and um, found them in Dothan. But when they saw him afar off, even became he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. So basically, 
Joseph's dad just put the coat on him and said, go supervise. Go be my eyes and ears. Go back out there. Go see what they're doing. You come back, you tell me what they're doing. And then you come back. And so he goes back. He's looking for them. They're not where they, he thought they would be. He talks to the guy. The guy says, hey, um, will you see my brothers? He says, yeah, they went down to Dothan. So he goes down to Dothan, not Alabama, but in Israel. Uh, <laughs> He goes down to Dothan, and, and when he gets to Dothan, he sees he, he's in the, far, in the far, but his brothers see this bright, loud coat. And they said, this one. And they get this idea, they, they get this idea, and I can hear them talking now. They're like, oh, no, we are so far from daddy. We could make up any story we want. This is our chance. He doesn't treat anybody else like this but, but that boy. But if he wasn't here anymore, I think things would be a lot easier. If he wasn't here anymore, life would be a lot better. So they, they, they see him afar off. He's happy-go-lucky, do-do-do-do-do, happy to go see my brothers. And his brothers are looking to kill him. So they see him coming up. They begin to plot on him. They conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, and I'm in verse 19, behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into a pit. And we'll say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will come of his dreams. Did y'all see what just happened there? The dreamer is coming. The one who, who wants to see things change. The one that has hope for a future. The dreamer is coming. If we kill him, we'll see what happens to these dreams. When I was reading this text, I, I, I went back in history, and I just was thinking, I didn't have to go real far, because I, I was thinking about another dreamer who made the state, who, who, who had a dream. He not only said it on, at Washington, but he went all over this country talking about a dream. And it was a whole bunch of folks who were saying, if we kill him, we'll see what will happen to that dream. And then I started thinking about a whole bunch of kids, a kid that was walking down the street with some Skittles and some iced tea who had some dreams and aspirations. I wonder what would happen if we kill him, if we, what will happen to these dreams if we kill him. Satan himself in the garden was mad at God and convinced Eve and Adam to eat from the tree because God, although it wasn't a dream, had a dream that he would be reconnected back to man. Satan then meets Jesus thousands of years later in, a, in, a, in the wilderness, tries to get him to trip up. These words that come from the, his brother's mouths are straight from the mouth of Satan, and he's been using this trick since the beginning of time. If I can kill the one who has the dream, the dream will die. If I can kill the one that has the vision, the people will stay in, in bondage. If I can take it out, and, and it kind of hit me very hard because we teach we, 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 we talk about dreams, we talk about progress and process, but above, you not above protecting your heart, but a, when you protect your heart, you also have to protect the dream that God gave. But there's a tightrope that you have to walk here now because if you protect the dream and the dream becomes God, it's just as detrimental, okay? But I want you to see that this is, this is, this is exactly how Satan works. You can look at it in the church, and I won't stay there long. But anytime somebody comes in with some vision, has pushed back. Look at it in our community. Anytime somebody's got a dream or some vision, has pushed back. That didn't just start because it was people were evil. That's Satan. And I want to encourage you that when you see it, call it out. And don't call it out in your own strength. Call it out in the name of Jesus. But, but call it out. Because that's a spirit. Okay? That's a spirit. And if, if we allow those spirits to take over our communities, our houses, our families, our churches, they'll keep running rampant. 
Okay, that's good. All right, let's keep. Um, 21, and Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands. And he said, let us not kill them. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, laid no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of his hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his cup, his coat of many colors that was on him. Now, I found this interesting because I've always kind of thought of Reuben as not the good guy. You know, Reuben is the guy, Reuben is like that vigilante justice guy. Y'all remember a couple of chapters ago, Reuben, uh, when he finds out that his sister Dinah has been raped, he was upset with how his father handled it. He said, you didn't do enough. You didn't protect her. And so Reuben and, and his brother Levi said, you know what? If you won't handle it, we're going to go down there and we're going to show them how you handle some justice. You want to tell, you want to mess with my sister? I said, they go kill all the men in the entire town. They burn it all up. Like they, they, they overcorrect. And so Reuben, who, who has this hot head, is the one with the level head, kinda? Kinda, because Reuben says, hey, hey, don't kill him, let's put him in slavery. And I wrestled here because Reuben saves his life, but he still gets broken. And it makes me, it's almost like the question of do you give someone the death sentence or do you put them in prison? Because although he spares his life, he goes into slavery. Reuben says, he says, don't, don't kill him. Don't kill him. He's our brother after all. It's like you know, on once, it's like Reuben had the good angel right here and the bad angel right here. You know, I, 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 I don't want him to die because he is my brother, but I hate him too. And this is, this is, this is a prime example of our heart not being quite clean, but we're better than everybody else we're around. You know, you, you're, the, you're the good, okay friend, but you still hadn't quite got it all, all together. And so he, Reuben says, don't kill him. We still can torture him, though. We, we still can wreak some havoc here. You know, I'm not going to paint Reuben as a saint because Reuben is not the saint. Reuben is not a good guy. He's just better than his brothers. So Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit it, in, it, that is in the wilderness and laid no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands. And it came to pass when Joseph had come unto his brothers, they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So there was no sustenance there. Like this wasn't a place for him to survive. This was a place for him to pot his own death. So there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes. And they looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead. And with their camels bearing spicery, balm, myrrh, going down to carry in Egypt. Let me pause right there. So they sit down and they eat. So historians would, would make us believe they're like 25 feet from Joseph. The King James Version makes us uh, insinuates that he says, please don't do this to me. So he's down in, in this pit. His brother is screaming out. They're 25 feet. Now, if I was a physicist, I could calculate how long it would take his voice to carry 25 feet. But the Bible would it, it suggest that it took 25 years for the, it to reach their hearts. Let's fast forward really quickly to Genesis 42. Genesis 42, they, the boys finally make it to Egypt, and they realize that they have sinned against their brother. Now, their brother is in great, <laughs> great status. Now that he's made it to be the prime minister of all of Egypt, they, they, they realize then we've sinned against him because now this is not going to look good for us. And I want you to think about that because often we feel justified in the things that we harbor in our hearts. His brother's sitting 25 feet, but it takes 25 years for it to penetrate his, his heart. How often do we feel like somebody did us wrong and we hold it? Y'all think about cancel culture. It seems like somebody gets canceled every week. Somebody's canceled every week. Somebody, this, one, this one did this one. They did that in 30 years ago. And, and we cancel all of these people. And we don't want to forgive anyone, but the moment somebody wants to hold something over us, we're like, am I not worthy of grace? 
And, and, I, and, I, and as much as there, I want you to hold rapists accountable and all of that stuff. But a Christian rhetoric says, repent, forgive. And that's not what's quite happening. And so as we study this text, I want us to think, although Joseph was lacking tact, although Joseph seemingly had the upper hand, was it justified that his brothers got rid of him? Was it justified that they walked, because they walked away without a tarnished conscience for a long time. And I just want you to think, and this don't have to be a really hard session, but I just want you to think, are there some things that you're holding in your heart that you thought you were justified to hold? Because they did you wrong, or you felt like you didn't like the way they made you feel, or they made you feel uh, subservient. All right, let's keep going. Verse 26, and Judah said unto his brothers, what profit it is to slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and our, his brethren were content. And they then passed by the Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Let's pause here. Because I want you to see something's happening, not just in this physical sense. There's something's happening in the spirit. Okay, Ishmael, 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 Ishmael. Where do you know that name? You know that from Abraham's firstborn, but not first begotten child? Ishmael. Ishmael, the father of the Muslims. Ishmael, who didn't do anything wrong, but was brought here by compromise. Now, they just compromised to instead of to kill their brother, they decided that they were going to sell him into slavery. So these Ishmaelites come about, and in the moment of compromise, they sell their bloodline to the enemy. They sell their bloodline to the enemy. Now, you know, in the Bible, the bloodline is everything. It was so important that you kept, that Jesus, God floods the earth to keep the way to Christ clean. That's essentially why, why the Noah account happens. To keep the way to the cross clean and not, in, not contaminated with all the sinful cross contamination with spirits. The bloodline from, from the sacrifices that are made at the altar of sacrifice to the cross of Jesus Christ is important. They sacrifice the bloodline because they don't have a picture of what the blood is worth yet. And I wanted to make that point because although the Israelites finally get a picture of it when they become a nation, they go from being a family to a nation, and they're wandering in the wilderness, and God has them build this tent and this tabernacle, our day, we don't understand what the blood costs. We don't understand what the bloodline is worth. And so they're willing to sacrifice the most valuable thing on earth because it makes them uncomfortable. And I, wa I, want you to, I want to say that because of this. Your faith in Christ and the power of the blood of Christ is the most valuable thing that you have on earth. And do not compromise that. And I say that with us on live. I say that here. Do not compromise that. I, we see more and more that people don't want to talk about the blood. They don't want to talk about this. It's the, it's the ugly, gory part of the gospel that nobody can talk about. Everybody wants to talk about the love of Christ. Everybody wants to talk about compassion and loving your neighbor. But without the blood, we have none of that. We, we have none of that. Don't compromise that. So they, they compromise their bloodline. They compromise the bloodline. And they sell it to the Ishmaelites. And, and then they passed by the Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. I'm sorry, I mean 28. And they brought Joseph into Egypt, 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not into the pit. And he rent his clothes. And he returned unto his brethren, and he said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat 
and killed a kid of goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this we have not, we, we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it. And he said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down to the grave until my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and a captain of the guard. So they've sold him. They've gotten rid of him. And Reuben doesn't seem to be completely clear on what's going on here. Because he was like, <laughs> I came to get him to sell him. And they present this, they present, they kill, a, 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 they kill an animal, they dip his stuff in blood, and they're like, he's dead. My grandmother had a saying when I was growing up, that if you will lie, there isn't much that you won't do. My parents had another saying that if you start lying, you're going to have to keep on lying. And that I think we see here where they start out with, well, we'll sell them into slavery. Now we got to tell this lie. Now we got to convince Daddy and Reuben and everybody else about what's going on. And, and, and so they've dug themselves into a hole. I want you to see that this all started with just a little bit of envy. A little bit of envy because Daddy favored him a little bit more than everybody else. And it turned into cold-blooded, first-degree, premeditated murder. And they were okay with it to leave, to eat a meal, and to go look their father in the eyes and say, your brother, your son is dead. It's easy for us to read this text and say, that is so hard to believe. But have y'all watched TV lately? Have you seen the headlines lately? This one snapped. That one snapped. <laughs> <laughs> this one slapping people on TV. It, it's, 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 we, it's, it's easy to read the text and be like, we're so far removed from that, but we're watching this play out on the Facebook and Twitter and on, on the news. Above all else, if I say nothing else this evening, guard your heart. Because people will say things, they will do things to you, they will convince you that they will, they will hurt your heart, make you feel some type of way. And you holding that malice in your heart hurts nobody but you. It hurts nobody but you. Your, 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 your lack of forgiveness, your, your envy for their vision, their dreams, whatever they got going on. And, and I say this to our young adults, this is graduation season. And I'm sure that there are some people who are watching who you didn't get to graduate this time. And you're watching all your friends go on without you. Guard your heart. Because you're, just because this isn't your time doesn't mean that your time will not come. So we're going to pick up next week in Potiphar's house. And a lot happens in Potiphar's house. <laughs> but, but I want you to remember, Joseph is being disciplined by his faith. And so he's enduring not because he did something wrong, not because he sinned, not because he's, he's in such a bad situation, but the discipline of faith cost you something. And the faith to unlock doors is not free. So we're going to continue to dig through this. His brothers have sold him. And, and really, I think that's enough to write a Lifetime movie on. And it doesn't end right there. So I know y'all just prayed, but it is our custom on with the Genesis study to close in prayer. So if y'all will pray with me, we'll, we'll get out of here. Gracious God, we thank you for the word of God that is fresh and, and very vibrant in our lives. God, we thank you that you have revealed to us truth, that you allow the word to work in us every single day so that we can be better and more disciplined in your faith, God. We pray that as each person drives to go home, that you would be with them and keep them. God, we pray that you would give us all peace of mind in the midst of chaos. 
We love you. We praise you. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. We'll see you next week. You all be blessed.